just sentences. This is a course that will run through all the ways sentences get longer and sometimes shorter and how control of those ways can improve our writing. Our goal will be to learn about how sentences work, what they do, how we can think and talk about them in the ways that will help both our own writing and our understanding of prose style. Part of our concern will be with stretching our sense of options, all the things a sentence can be or do, and part with the notion of style itself. In other words, this is a course in which we will dance with language, not a course in which we will trudge toward remedial correctness. This is a course designed to help you write better sentences. Sentences are shaped by specific context and driven by specific purpose, so no rules or mechanical protocols can prepare us for the infinite number of tasks our sentences must accomplish. But there are a number of basic strategies or moves we can learn that help make our sentences more effective, no matter what the specific task. This course will concentrate on a broad range of effective moves or strategies, many of them associated with the cumulative sentence, a particularly useful syntax employed by professional writers and best understood in terms first laid out by composition theorist Francis Christensen back in the 1960s. But before we can work with a specific syntax such as the cumulative or its opposite, the suspensive, we need to understand the basic principles that guide the creation and use of all sentences. Accordingly, this course will look closely and carefully at sentences from a number of different angles, starting with their underlying logic and moving through the reasons why we cannot rigorously separate the form of a sentence from its content, its meaning from its style. We will look at the ways sentences work whether the most basic and minimal kernel sentences that are nothing more than a subject joined with a verb to the most elaborate and extended master sentences, some stretching to lengths of more than a hundred words. This will be a course devoted to understanding some of the secrets of prose style. It will have as its goal and reason for being the double challenge of understanding elegant and effective writing and of learning some of the ways in which we can produce it. But I have to start with an acknowledgement, if not an admission. Even though the nature of prose style has been a subject of heated debate for at least a couple of thousand years, we find ourselves today with no clear definition of what we mean by style and no agreement on any but the most subjective standards for judging when style is effective, much less elegant. Everyone who writes about prose style explicitly or implicitly advances a particular view of it and each view reflects the personal values and preferences of that particular writer. Yet, somehow, we generally agree that there is something called prose style we generally agree on a number of aspects of writing that seem to have something to do with style, and we generally agree that there are some writers, ranging from Shakespeare to Virginia Woolf, Joan Didion to John Updike, Don DeLillo to Marilyn Robinson, who just seem to be better at it than others. Accordingly, this course can't begin to explain all or even very many of the mysteries of prose style nor can it offer universally agreed upon standards for writing that is elegant or effective. That former term, always a matter of personal taste, and the latter term, always a combination of personal taste with the particular requirements of a specific rhetorical situation. What this course can do is look closely and carefully at sentences the most important building blocks of prose, the foundation of written communication, and always the essential units of prose style. This is what I mean when I call myself a writer, writes novelist Don DeLillo. I construct sentences. Thomas Berger, the author of Little Big Man and a writer like DeLillo, 
long celebrated for the vitality of his language, makes much the same point when he terms the sentence, the cell beyond which the life of the book cannot be traced, a novel being a structure of such cells. In another sense, Berger explains, only the sentence exists, or at any rate can be proved to exist. Even at the stage of the paragraph, things are becoming theoretical and arbitrary. A novel is an utter hallucination. No definition of it, for example, can really distinguish it from a laundry list. But a sentence, there you have something essential to which nothing can be added and from which nothing can be taken. I think I know why DeLillo and Berger declare their passionate allegiance to the sentence. And while I don't pretend to understand and certainly can't write sentences as well as either of them, I think I do understand that the sentence is where we must start if we hope to understand why some writing captivates us and other writing leaves us unmoved, uninterested. I think I do understand that to be better writers, we must first and foremost write better sentences. And I'm absolutely certain that whatever elegant and effective writing may be, the secret to achieving it has largely to do with learning how to write elegant and effective sentences. So as I said before, this will be a course about sentences. Even more bluntly, this will be a course about how to make sentences longer. Now, why longer? It's hard to improve on any of the well-known, justly celebrated one and two word sentence classics our culture has enshrined. Jesus wept, the shortest verse in the New Testament comes to mind, as does nuts, the famous reply offered by General Anthony McAuliffe, acting commander of the 101st Airborne, when the Germans demanded his surrender during the Battle of the Bulge. But no one can really teach how to write one and two word sentences. And most of us will go a lifetime without being presented with the opportunity for crafting stunning short sentences. So for reasons I hope to make clear as the course proceeds, this is a course about how we make sentences longer. And a course based on my assumption that longer sentences, and this is important, longer sentences when carefully crafted and tightly controlled are essential keys to elegant and effective writing. Which is to say that I find Joseph Conrad's elegantly balanced and extended sentence describing a native woman in Heart of Darkness, and I love this sentence, she was savage and superb, wild-eyed and magnificent, there was something ominous and stately in her deliberate progress. I find that sentence more interesting as a sentence than either nuts or Jesus wept. And I can show you the writing principles that underlie Conrad's celebrated sentence, while nuts or Jesus wept were both dictated by unique situations quite beyond the study of prose style. My assumption that longer sentences are the keys to elegant and effective writing crucially and inextricably rests on yet another assumption, one unfortunately best expressed in an old advertising slogan originally made famous by a cigarette manufacturer and quickly appropriated by WAGs to refer to something other than cigarettes. It's not how long you make it, but how you make it long. Accordingly, this course will not be about making sentences longer nearly as much as it will be about the ways in which we can do that. Why should a sequence of words be anything but a pleasure is a saying attributed to Gertrude Stein. And certainly, the sequences of words we identify as sentences are capable of providing pleasure just as surely as they are capable of conveying crucial information. Sometime, the most important information sentences convey is pleasure, as they unfold their meanings in ways that tease, surprise, test, and satisfy. Sometime, 
the way sentences unfold their meaning is the most important meaning they offer. Let's start by thinking about what a sentence is and how it works. And let's start with that sentence from Gertrude Stein. Why should a sequence of words be anything but a pleasure? We know sentences can function as exclamations, imperatives, declarations, or interrogatives. And this one seems, at first glance, to be an interrogative. It asks a question. It's a simple question, or is it? Isn't it really a declaration that a sequence of words should be a pleasure? Or is it? Or is it an invitation to list the numerous occasions when a sequence of words is definitely not a pleasure? I have a case of stomach flu comes to mind. Or the Internal Revenue Service has selected your return from last year for an audit. Not much pleasure there. Or is it an argument that language should do nothing but give pleasure? Does it almost have the force of an exclamation saying, in effect, words in sequence, always a pleasure? What, in point of fact, does this seemingly simple sequence of words actually mean? How does it actually work? Insofar as we think we understand what Stein meant with the above phrase, what are some of the ways she could have gotten that meaning across with different sentences? Just think of a few of the many, many different ways she might have written this sentence. Why should a sequence of words not be a pleasure? Why should a sequence of words not give pleasure? Shouldn't a sequence of words always give pleasure? A sequence of words should always be a pleasure. A sequence of words should always be pleasurable. Words in sequence should always give pleasure. We should always find pleasure in a sequence of words. Or, why should a sequence of words not always give us pleasure? And so on and on and on and on. Stein's question, of course, is a sentence, itself a sequence of words. But it is a sequence of words that can be understood in a number of different ways. And I want us to think about some of the important things we can learn about sentences just from thinking carefully about Stein's question. Now, sentences are sequences of words, but just adding words together to make a sequence does not create a sentence. Teacher yellow September swims hungry is a sequence of words, but it's not a sentence because it lacks a subject and a predicate and therefore does not express a proposition. I am a teacher is a sequence of words that is a sentence because it contains a subject, I, and a predicate, am a teacher, and thus it does advance a proposition. The subject is who or what is spoken of or talked about, and the predicate is what is said about the subject. Usually, the subject of a sentence will be a noun or noun phrase or pronoun, and the predicate will contain some form of verb. A proposition, which is usually expressed in the form of a sentence, is a statement about reality that can be accepted or rejected. The relationship between propositions and sentences is a little hard to pin down since a sentence will always advance or express one or more propositions and a proposition will always be in the form of a sentence. The key here is to think of a sentence as being a visible piece of writing and the propositions it advances as assumptions and ideas not necessarily written out. The easiest way about thinking about this relationship is to say that a written sentence usually rests on or contains or combines a number of underlying propositions, most of which the sentence simply assumes and which would be too basic or simple sounding to actually write out. I like to think of the written sentence as the part of the iceberg you see above water, while many of its underlying propositions remain out of sight underwater. 
Put another way, propositions are the atoms from which the molecule of the sentence is constructed. Most propositions usually contain several smaller or constituent propositions. As we see in the proposition I mentioned a moment ago, I am a teacher, which contains within it the proposition that I exist, there is an I, and that there is something we call a teacher, there is a thing called teacher, and that I am one of those things. So while many of us have been taught that a sentence is a sequence of words containing a subject and a predicate that expresses an idea, it's actually the case that most sentences express or imply a number of ideas. I like hamburgers expresses a thought, but what exactly do I mean by like? What kind of hamburger am I thinking of? And why do I want someone to know this about my taste habits? As is frequently the case, a number of questions can be asked about this simple declaration, and each question reminds us of unspoken, unwritten propositions that may underlie the surface of this sem seemingly simple and clear sentence. And we all know that sentences can convey a host of meanings, both intended and unintended, just as the manner of conveying any meaning may differ along a continuum of emotional impacts described by one stylistic theorist, Walker Gibson, as ranging from tough style to sweet style to stuffy style. For instance, I might have said, you better believe I like hamburgers, which would be tough style, or don't you just think hamburgers are fabulous, which would be a sweet style, or my gastronomic preferences include but are not limited to that peculiarly American version of the sandwich known as a hamburger, definitely a stuffy style. If we return for a moment to Gertrude Stein's sentence, why should a sequence of words be anything but a pleasure? We can see that it actually advances a number of propositions, including there are these things we call words. Words can be put together in a sequence. Words in a sequence can give pleasure. Words in a sequence ought to give pleasure. Words in a sequence should give nothing but pleasure. And are there reasons why words in a sequence should not be a pleasure? The point here is simply that the basic unit of writing is the proposition, not the word or even a sequence of words. And we build sentences by putting propositions together. The style of our sentences is determined by the ways in which we combine, not words, but the propositions those words stand for or refer to. Sentences convey information organizing it into propositions or statements, and then combining those propositions through syntactical arrangements that establish the logical relationships between and among them. So, one of our first goals will be to understand how sentences combine propositions to present information, and how we can use our knowledge of the ways in which sentences put propositions together to present our own ideas more effectively. Each sentence we write reflects three main kinds of choices we make. Number one, what to write about and what we want to accomplish writing about it. Number two, which words to use. And number three, what order to put those words in. Now there's not much that I or any other writing teacher can do in this or any other writing course to help you choose your subject matter or propositional content or to help you decide what you want your writing to do. But I can address some important things you'll want to keep in mind as you choose the words you use, particularly the degree of precision in your vocabulary choices. And I can address some even more important concerns in the way you put together the words you choose. Now we call that order syntax, and the order in which our sentences unfold or hit the reader 
is entirely within our control. Even better, syntactical choices can actually help us increase the precision of our writing, bringing what we say into sharper focus, even if we don't have command of the most precise vocabulary. Sometimes we refer to the choice of words we use as paradigmatic choices and to the choices about the order we put them in as syntagmatic choices. In this sense, we might imagine that each sentence we write results from paradigmatic choices we make along a vertical axis of alternate vocabulary choices we might make for each word in the sentence. And each sentence we write results from syntagmatic choices we make along a horizontal axis we read from left to right, deciding whether to put the verb early or late in the sentence, deciding where to put modifying phrases, deciding whether the information in the sentence will be coordinated, adding phrases like cars to a train, or subordinated, one piece of information made a clarifying helper to a more important piece of information. The terms paradigmatic and syntagmatic are not in themselves important for us to remember, but they help us understand two of the most important variables in our writing. Add the large factor of subject and purpose, which as I pointed out may not always be within our control, and the sentences we write combine three kinds of choices. The propositions we want to advance, the vocabulary we choose, and the syntax or order in which we want our readers to experience our propositions. Paying closer attention to the precision and syntax of the sentences we write can dramatically sharpen or improve propositional content. Now, going back to Stein's, why should a sequence of words be anything but a pleasure? We can see that in place of sequence of words, she might have said string of words or series of words or bunch of words or combination of words or number of words or she might just have said why should words be anything but a pleasure leaving out sequence altogether but she chose the word sequence over a number of other possibilities just as she chose to use the word pleasure over gratification, satisfaction, joy, delight, or any number of other words suggesting a positive experience. This reminds us that any word we write is chosen from a list of synonyms or a list of words that are either more or less abstract. When I write, I got into my car, for instance, I could have used a much more abstract word such as vehicle or transportation. I got in my vehicle, I got in my transportation. Or I could have used a less abstract word such as sedan or minivan. I got in my sedan, I got in my minivan. Or I could have chosen an even less abstract, more precise word or term such as Ford or Ford Fusion. I got in my Ford Fusion. In this sense, each word we write in a sentence represents a choice from what we might think of as a vertical series of words above the word we choose, which would be more abstract, or below the word we choose, which would be more precise. Semanticists refer to this as the ladder of abstraction, and it reminds us that one of the important variables in our writing is the degree of precision in our choice of the words that we use. The other choice we make when we write a sentence is the order in which we arrange the words we choose. For example, Stein could just as easily have made her question, why should we get anything but pleasure from a sequence of words? We might think of the order in which words appear in a sentence as choices made along that horizontal axis that horizontal axis we call syntax. Now that we've identified the three main factors that determine the style and effectiveness of our writing, 
propositional content, word choice, and syntax. Let's go back to our sentence from Gertrude Stein one more time to see the most important assumption underlying this course, that the same words in different order have different meanings. Or to put this another way, that style is content. Most of us have been taught to think of style and meaning, or form and content, as two different things. And indeed, it is almost impossible to talk about language without resorting to this binary opposition. We think of content as the ideas or information our writing conveys, and we think of style as the way in which we present these ideas. Many aphorisms and metaphors have been used through the years to describe style, ranging from style is the man himself to style is the dress of thought. Now, most of these metaphors confuse our understanding of style as much or more than they clarify it. If we have to use a metaphor to explain style, we might think of the onion, which consists of numerous layers of onion we can peel away until there's nothing left. The onion is its layers, and those layers don't contain a core of onionness, but they are themselves the onion. Similarly, when we write a sentence, the way we choose to order its propositional content subtly affects that content so that the meaning changes ever so slightly with every vocabulary and syntactical choice we make. It's probably safe to say that all of us can agree that the point of Stein's why should a sequence of words be anything but a pleasure is that words should do more than just convey information, that language is itself an experience worth considering quite apart from its reference. But do we really believe that why should a sequence of words be anything but a pleasure means exactly the same as why shouldn't words in sequence always be a pleasure? Shouldn't a sequence of words be always a pleasure? A sequence of words should always be a pleasure, or my favorite, the Yoda variant, always a pleasure, words in sequence should be. We read these sentences differently. Each reflects different stylistic choices, and each hits the reader just a little bit differently than does Stein's original sentence, which is dismissive of opposition, as only Gertrude Stein could be. Another way of looking at this assumption that form is content, style is meaning, is to say that when we write, we are doing something with our sentences. And what we do unfolds in time, whether to our reader's eyes or ears. The summarizable or paraphrasable information conveyed in our sentences is only a part of their meaning since what they do to a reader, the way they direct the reader's thinking and unfold information, may be as or more important than the information they contain. And the, the point of all of this is simply to remind us of something we never forget in speaking to one another, that the way we say things may be as or more important than what we say, but it's something we frequently forget when we are writing. However, when we write, we need to remember that the style of a sentence is its content. This inseparability of form from content was what poet Archibald MacLeish was trying to explain in his poem Ars Poetica when he famously noted that a poem should not mean but be. And the same is true of sentences. Or, to put this another way, the informational or propositional content of a sentence is not the same as the sentence's meaning, since the sentence doesn't just carry information like putting objects in a canister, but it does things with it and to it, shaping it to particular purposes and affects. And this important sense, sentences work like verbs, doing things, taking action, rather than like nouns that only name. 
understanding how sentences put propositions together is the first step in understanding how they do things, the ways in which they work, the ways they present information and the ways they unfold their meanings, and to learn how to make them work for us. We will do this by studying the ways in which sentences combine information by coordinating it, subordinating it, or subsuming it in modification. We will look at the difference between sentences that combine information through loose syntax that puts the subject and the verb near the beginning of the sentence and those that do so through periodic syntax, delaying the unfolding of the sentence's most important news until the very end, creating a sense of suspense that demands the reader's attention, sometimes to that very last word. In the 18th century, this syntax of delay was seen as the gold standard of fine writing, a sign of the writer's care, control, and sophistication. Indeed, masterful 18th century writers such as Dr. Samuel Johnson referred to the sentences they wrote not as sentences but as periods. Now, to escape that historical prejudice which hangs on in many composition manuals but no longer holds true for our understanding and evaluation of sentence structure, I'll usually refer to periodic sentences, those sentences that delay the delivery of their most important information to the very end, as suspensive sentences. We will pay particular attention to the cumulative sentence, a special kind of loose syntax that can also function suspensively because it offers powerful generative or heuristic advantages to the writer who understands its forms. We will study the sentence as a thing in motion, a thing alive, considering the strategies writers can use to give sentences pace and rhythm, particularly the duple rhythms of balance and the three-beat rhythms of serial constructions. In short, this course will reveal some of the syntactic strat strategies professional writers regularly employ. These are also strategies we can use in our writing to ensure that our sentences will be effective and possibly even elegant.